never want to have to turn and go away It might feel better, it might feel better if you stay Yeah, yeah I bet you haven't heard a word I've said Yeah, yeah If you've had enough of all you're trying Just give up the state of mind you're in If you want to be somebody else If you're tired of fighting battles with yourself If you want to be somebody else Change your mind Change your mind Hey, hey Have you ever danced in the rain or thank the sun Just for shining just for shining more the sea Oh no Take it all in the world to show And yeah, you look much better Look much better when you glow Yeah, yeah I hope you heard every word I said Yeah, yeah If you've had enough of all you're trying Just give up the state of mind you're in if you want to be somebody else If you're tired of fighting battles with yourself If you want to be somebody else Change your mind Change your mind Both go and seize the day Cause what's your hurry, what's your hurry anyway Yeah, yeah I hope you heard every word I said Yeah, yeah If you've had enough of all you're trying Just give up the state of mind you're in If you That was that was God. All right, so uh, I'm doing the announcements today for Heather. Don't worry, nothing's on fire yet. All right, all right. First thing, you know, a lot of times as a pastor we feel completely useless, but today is not one of those days. All right, so we're taking up a collection. There's somebody in our congregation that's going on deployment this month, and uh, uh, for he and his platoon, we are collecting items. Uh, to help support our troops. So we're doing this in conjunction with the American Legion, VFW, and some other groups. Um, so please take part in this. If you want to help su support our buddy and uh, you want to help support our troops, uh, there are little cards outside on the table. I believe this is true, Dina, right? Yes, all right. Uh, and it has a list of wonderful things. And although Sudoku is not on there, I have it on good authority that Sudoku is a, is a wonderful game to play. I happen to be very good at Sudoku. That's a weird boast. All right, so that's the first thing. That's awesome, right? So not only supporting our troops, but supporting somebody in our own congregation. Number two, uh, you all know that my favorite thing in the world is the journey. All right, Jesus 
but then very close second is the journey. Uh, so this is our best opportunity to, you know, especially if you're new or you haven't gone through journey before, to help you understand who God is, who you are in God, and especially this, and this is something that we really focus on in the journey. It's just seven weeks. Nice, easy thing, and you can do it right after church. <laughs> so you sit on it. Uh, uh, is what was the thing? Is God and then us and then how we relate to each other. And this is the most important thing uh, to understand that God loves you. And so it's seven weeks of learning about how much God loves you. Who wouldn't want to do that, right? So that's the journey, and it uh, begins the second Sunday of every month, and we'd love to see you there. And then lastly, uh, worship night, which is uh, the second Wednesday of every month. Uh, where's Mike? Is Mike up? No, Mike. Uh, there, there he is. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mike McDermott, our uh, intrepid leader, uh, leads us every month, and uh, this band is so good, and the time is so good, and we kind of keep the lights low, and you can just mellow out and talk to God and reset, you know? Worship night is really one of those good life things. So lots of good stuff going on, right? And that wasn't terrible. Please, when Heather comes back, can you tell her I did a good job? <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're currently in a series called The Art of Missing the Point, and today's topic is the church, and Mike will be focusing on maybe some of the misconceptions uh, that we have as a church and that um, culture has towards us. And for, for me, I'm, I'm a, a wicked, wicked introvert. I've shared this before. Um, has, has anyone taken the Myers-Briggs test? So I am an INTP, and I score very high on the introvert uh, category. So being a part of this community has really helped me, and sp specifically being a part of the band, uh, it's just everyone here has been so encouraging, and it's really helped me to grow as a person. And uh, we actually, Heather came in to our rehearsal on Tuesday, and she shot a little promo video for us. So if you go on the website, you can check it out. If you want to be a part of this band community, which has helped me so much, uh, go and check out the promo video. And you can come and talk to me. You can send an email to NEC Cares if you'd like more information, if you'd like to be a part of the band. So why don't you stand and join us for our next song. We'd love to hear your voices on your love, O oh Lord. Reaches to the heaven, your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain, yeah. shadows of your wings Your love, O oh Lord reaches to the heaven Your faithfulness stretches to the sky Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain, yeah. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings I will 
lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadows of your wings. I will lift my voice to worship you, my find my strength in the shadows of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. You can take a seat. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. For great to come and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in this city. to the restless you are there is no one like our God there is no one like our God greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in this city Thank you. 
Thanks, King. That's great. Ooh. Morning, everyone. You are all going to heaven because it's our first like sunny day and you're here. All right. So thank you. <laughs> um, for those of you who knew, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're in the middle of a series we're doing called um, The Art of Missing the Point, and we've been looking at these like basic building blocks, basic elements, topics of, of faith, and showing how we often miss the point and miss the, the, the real emphasis that the Bible's trying to teach on those things. And this week, we're talking about how, the, how we miss the point on church, which is kind of interesting. It's the that, you know, we're talking about how we miss the point on ourselves. And so, uh, but it, it's really the case. Um, how many times have you said something like this? Well, um, I'm headed out to go to church. Yeah, you may have said that this morning. <laughs> and meaning that you're going to this worship service that, that uh, we are currently in. Um, that, you know, uh, that's a misconception. That's a misunderstanding of the church. Church is not a program. It's not an, a service. Um, another way we, we miss the point on church is like uh, mixing it up with a building. Oh, I left my jacket at church. <laughs> uh, church is not a building. It's not a, a, a white building with a steeple or a for, former bowling alley. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's not a program or a service. It's not a building. Uh, another one uh, that often gets confused is like, hey, uh, uh, it's Sunday, I'm going to church, and it's similar to misconception to the other ones, but it's a little bit nuanced in that church is a day of the week, like one day of the week, like, hey, on Sundays I go to church, and the rest of the week, look out, uh, and, and so that, that, that's a, a, a common misconception. And, um, and then in negative sense, you often heard, oh yeah, church is just a bunch of hypocrites, or church is just a bunch of goody two-shoes, and, and uh, that's, a, that's a cultural misunderstanding, you know? Uh, we, we are a collection of people, and so um, there are varying levels of, of human goodness and uh, human missing the pointness in, in every collection of individuals. So what is, what is the church? And why, and maybe more importantly, why is it, why would we want to be a part of it? That's what we're going to look at today. And I'm using a really intriguing passage that uh, has some kind of weird elements to it. Uh, one, there's a supernatural element to it, which we're not used to hearing uh, in a day in and day out basis. But if you think about it, if, if God is supernatural, he's not human, um, then uh, God's activities is going to be su supernatural. So don't let that throw you. And then the other reason why it's intriguing is because it really is, there's a, <laughs> there's a point where people are calling this this early gathering of the church, uh, like, drunkards. <laughs> I'm serious. We'll, you'll see when we get there. So, so they're making fun of the church, and there's some supernatural stuff. So it's a, it's a great passage to be able to say, what is church really, and why is it so awesome to be a part of one? That's what we're going to look at today. And the passage, I'll set it up just a little bit more, is it's really the first formal gathering of the church. And uh, um, we'll see by the end of this, uh, hopefully this passage will make a lot of sense. But it's Acts chapter 2. And if you're new to the Bible, Acts, it's not like a throwing Acts. It's, <laughs> it's A-C-T-S, Acts of the Apostles. And the Apostles were sort of, uh, you know, Jesus' disciples that sort of kind of sent out his, his friends, his followers, his closest uh, uh, apprentice, apprentices, apprentices. Uh, um, to, to, uh, to carry on the work that he, that he began. And so that's what Acts of the Apostles are. And so uh, it's the fifth book in the New Testament. Um, and we're going to look at the second chapter, Acts chapter 2. So uh, I'll, I'll read through it. Um, I'll pause a little bit halfway through, and then uh, I'll, explain, I'll explain it all a little bit in, in, in better detail. Um, when the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They meaning um, those who had uh, been with Jesus, who saw Jesus' death and resurrection, and have now put their faith in Jesus. Uh, so they were all together in one place. And without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. 
Then like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit thread spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. That's the uh, supernatural part. There were Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were blown away. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on. And they kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? Uh, that's the li a little town uh, not too far outside of Jerusalem. Uh, how come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. Immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. So let me pause there and, so, and, and just talk a little bit about what's going on. So Pentecost, when this is happening, is uh, 50 days. Pentecost literally means 50 days. It, it's a, it was a Jewish celebration that occurred 50 days after the Passover. And so it was a big, it was a big religious uh, f sort of celebration festival uh, feast day. And so Jew, Jews from around Jerusalem would obviously show up to, to uh, partake in the religious celebrations, but it also attracted Jews from all around the world, and people would, uh, would come and gather. And so there was these, all, these, all these different people. And, uh, um, and then a, a small group of these people are folks who um, believe that Christ was God, that he died and rose. They saw him, and they were so moved that they put their faith in him. And they're showing up as well because there wasn't this separation between Christianity and Judaism at the time. Um, and and uh, they, were, they, they, were, they just figured it was just an extension. It was just a fulfillment of, of their, their, uh, their, their faith that they grew up in. And so they're all worshiping together when all of a sudden this, this wind just kind of blows through there. And uh, it, it sort of settles on them. And it says it's God's spirit, the Holy Spirit. It just, it just sort of rests on them. And, at, and uh, they go about their, their merry way, and unbeknownst to them, they are, when they speak, people from other, uh, uh, other people groups, other language groups can understand them. And uh, so you have... Um, so they probably knew Hebrew. Uh, they prob there's a chance that those guys knew Greek, so they're probably multilingual a little bit, but there's no way they knew all those. There's no way they knew Egyptian and uh, uh, all those other things. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and so the people come running in because they heard this like whoosh, and so they're like, what's happening? And then all of a sudden it dawns on them, we can understand what they're saying. And they're sort of blown away by that. And so uh, the thing you have to take from this, the, this piece of the passage is this, that, um, that, that, that God's spirit is working in those people. And it's causing them to do something they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And at the same time, it's just happening in everyday, ordinary life. It wasn't any kind of special thing. I mean, they, they were gathered for a religious festival, but they, they, they've done that year after year after year. It was just an ordinary part of life, and then God showed up it, it, and, and, it, and rested in them and did a thing that they couldn't do on their own. And so um, that, there's three really big characteristics here that are always present, or often present, I should say, when God is at work. <laughs> um, one, it is usually part of just everyday life. It's part of the run-of-the-mill, uh, going to work, coming home, grabbing coffee at Dunks, or uh, where, you know, uh, it's just a part of everyday life. The second element is uh, when, when God shows up and does something, usually it's beyond your capabilities, it's your, beyond your capacity. I like to think of New England Chapel, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it's almost two years since we started our first service in this building, and, and I'm still, in, I'm still amazed that we could 
pull this off, right? So when this came on the market, a bunch of developers wanted this building. It's 7.6 acres. And um, um, we, we were like this little un underrepresented, under, like we didn't really know what we were doing. I mean, we knew what we were doing, but we weren't realtors. We weren't brokers. We weren't developers. And so um, it was basically, you know, pastors and elders coming before the, the realtors saying, hey, this is the offer we can make. And uh, I remember the realtor uh, scoffed at me when I handed it because it was $750,000 below asking price, right? <laughs> and, and she's like, I don't even want... <laughs> I don't even want to give this to the owners. <laughs> um, literally, like, I think she clucked, like, um. <laughs> and uh, so fast forward it, uh, we beat everybody out. Fast forward it, we got a piece of property that developers were drooling over, uh, three quarters of a million dollars below asking price. How did that happen? That is beyond our capabilities. It's beyond the elders and my capabilities to pull something like that off. And so it's, it's sort of everyday business. When God's involved, he goes beyond your human capacity. And then the other thing that happens is God's goodness is, is sort of on display when it happens. And so at the very end of that last part of scripture that I read, it said, they're speaking our language, describing God's mighty works. God is, yeah, God's sort of on display. People are experiencing God in new ways. Those are three characteristics that are often um, um, present when God's at work. Uh, it's ordinary life. You never would have guessed it was going to happen that day. It, it, it's stuff that goes beyond what you're, you're capable of. Um, and God, uh, people experience God in new ways, in different ways. And so let me keep on reading. Here comes the drunk part. <laughs> Their heads were spinning. So these are the people like, what's going on? I can hear them in Egyptian. And I know these guys can't speak it, right? Uh, so their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? And then the people from New England joked, saying, they're drunk on cheap wine. <laughs> no, there, there wasn't New Englanders present at the time, but that would have been us for sure. Uh, they're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up. And backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, and all of you who are visiting from Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Obviously, they've never been to Boston on St. Patty's Day. <laughs> But I love this. I love this passage. It's so like um, it's so like salt of the earth. Like um, you can't you can't make this stuff up. Like and they're like, this is too crazy. The only explanation is that I don't know how like drunkenness would cause you to speak in in other people's languages. Uh, but um, the rest we just that's just 15 verses. I didn't want to keep on reading and reading, but uh, you can check it out on home Acts chapter two. Um, but the rest of the story is this. He, Peter goes on to say, hey, this is what all the Old Testament scriptures were talking about. There'll come a time where um, God's promises come true in a, in, in a more fulfilled way, and God will be with and in his people and do great things. Um, and this moment is sort of the kickoff of the church. And so this is not just an intriguing passage because um, it, it has some, like, divine acts in it or because uh, it's funny because they thought they were drunk. Or, or it, it's, it's, it's actually a really interesting passage because it really shows the importance uh, uh, or really the awesomeness of the church and why uh, people from Franklin and beyond uh, would love to be a part of the church. And so let me help connect the dots for you. In order for me to help connect the dots, I need to grab a piece of my sermon from a couple weeks ago. Um, because a, a few weeks ago when we did the Bible, I talked about how the Bible is really a four-act play. You need to understand those four acts in order to understand the church. You can't divorce the church from the story of God, and which is really the story of human, uh, uh, of human existence. 
If you remove the church from that story, you get misconceptions like a church is a set of beliefs or a church is a uh, building or a church is a service or a church is a program. Um, but when it's grafted into the story of God, all of a sudden the meaning comes clear and simple. So I grabbed those four slides and I want to start again. So, so, so um, if you weren't here, let me, let me sum up in two sentences. Uh, my, my sermon was this. Hey, a lot of the confusion over the Bible is the fact that people think it's one book, but it's not. It's a micro library. It's a library of 66 books that were written over a thousand years by 40 different authors. Many of the authors didn't even know the other ones existed. Um, in three different languages, in, in, in many different countries, as foreign as Egypt is from Italy. And so um, the Bible is that collection, that library of 66 books, but each of those books tells one unified story. And one of the best ways I could describe that uniform story in, in four minutes or less is by using the concept of a four-act play. And so this is basically the, uh, the Bible in a nutshell. Act one is creation or the creator. God is the creator. He's the main sort of character in, in, in the story of human existence. And uh, he sets out to make a good and beautiful world. And in that good and beautiful world, there's balance and harmony and thriving and flourishing. And um, if you look at Genesis 1, it's this beautiful poem of, uh, uh, you know, this picture, I try to really grab some pictures that just give some sense of awesomeness of uh, God's creation. And at the center of creation, God uh, makes human beings. And he says, I am making human beings in my image and in my likeness, and I'm calling them to my purposes, right? So the, in Act 1, we get the purpose for the human race. The purpose for the human race is to um, receive all the goodness, beauty, awesomeness, love, grace, mercy of God, and take it out with you in the world around you. So literally, uh, to be God's image and be God's likeness means to take all the good wirings that you have as someone created in God's image and let them, on, let them on display in the world around you, uh, at work, at home, um, on the soccer field, uh, on the baseball field, um, at the restaurant, everywhere. Bear God's goodness. Bear God's beauty. And so every time you're smart, every time you're creative, every time you're ingenious, every time you're, you're uh, courageous, generous, uh, truthful, brave, um, uh, self-sacrificing, every time you're any good quality that mimics God, you're leaning into your divine purpose. And in, in Act 1, God basically says, I want you to rule the world with me, all right? It's a really high calling. It brings a lot of meaning to the work that we do as people. So that's Acts chapter 1. Uh, that, sorry, that's the, that's the first act. Uh, act 2 is, the, I, I, I would sum it up by saying the choice. And the choice is uh, really best on display in that scene um, where uh, Adam and Eve are standing. This is uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, standing before the tree. And it's the only tree, like God's like, hey, this is a beautiful place. Uh, have free reign, but just don't eat from the tree of, good, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? That's the only one that's off, off limits for you guys. Run around like crazy people, um, but just, you know, back away from this tree. And so, <laughs> human nature, right? So, there they are. Uh, it's a perfect picture of choice, and they're standing in front of the tree, and they're like, hmm, I wonder why you said that. That fruit doesn't look so bad. Um, and then this mysterious figure that in Genesis 3 pops up in the form of a serpent. Uh, a little bit later, you, you, it's kind of, uh, it's you know, sort of evil. is kind of described as a crouching tiger. Um, and, uh, and the serpent's whispering to uh, the human beings, hey, you don't need that old man. <laughs> God's just trying to hold back from you. Um, forget about what he says about this tree. Claim power. Claim the knowledge of good and evil for yourself. And so they have a choice between listening uh, to God, trusting God, or um, <laughs> my kids, kids like this illustration, or giving God the Heisman. <laughs> have you ever seen the Heisman trophy? Uh, and, and so they decide to give God the Heisman. They're like, I don't care about your definitions of good and evil. We're going to make our own, and we're going to do our own thing. And that's the choice. And they choose not God. And so why does God allow for choice? He allows for choice because love demands choice. You can't have love without choice. And so we're always faced with the ability to choose God or not God. He's never going to force us 
to follow him, to love him, to understand him. Just like you could never force someone to love you. Um, it has to be won. It has to be elicited. And so um, that's, that's uh, uh, Act 2. Act 2 plays out for all of the Old Testament, all right, 39 books. And it, it, what happens is uh, God sends guides through the Torah and the law and, and ambassadors through the prophets and the priests during the Old Testament to call his people back to his original plan, back to this beautiful calling. And sometimes it works for a little while, but then eventually uh, we got the crossroads of choice. Uh, I'm going to grab selfishness, fear, ego causes us to choose poorly time and time again. And, um, and then the Old Testament ends with this just this promise that God will make things right um, because we can't get back there on our own. So that's Acts ch enters Act chapter, uh, the third act. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to preach on Acts and talk about an act at the same time. Uh, the, the third act is the Christ, uh, uh, Jesus. The Christ is a label that just means uh, anointed one. Uh, it's also translated as Messiah. He's the promised one from the Old Testament that said, hey, um, God's going to set things right. Well, God sets things right by sneaking back into creation um, and, um, and, and sort of living among us and showing us what that original plan was. And if you want to look at God's values, you want to look at how God would respond to adversity, how God would respond to uh, sinners, uh, just watch Jesus. And you get a refreshing, non-religious take on what it was all about. And, and so Jesus not only shows us the way, um, but then provides the way for us to follow. And let me pause real quick, because I left out this element uh, a couple weeks ago that that, that little ominous figure, you know, that uh, shows up right out of the gate in Jesus' sort of initial public ministry. And uh, even if you're not familiar with uh, the Bible, you might have heard of the temptations of Christ. And um, there's books and, and movies done about it. But the temptations of Christ is basically that, that serpent-y figure showing up again and saying, hey, uh, you could short-circuit the pain and suffering that you're headed for. Um, just choose not God, and I'll make it happen. Uh, I'll give you everything you want. Just follow me instead of God. And so uh, Jesus is the first one on record to say, nope, not going to do it, and lives the life that we were designed for. And then um, the religious leaders and uh, uh, just couldn't take it um, and end up crucifying him. But it's all part of God's plan. Because, because of his death and resurrection, Jesus is able to unplug evil by forgiving it. And he's able to restore us because our sins are forgiven. And he's able to reconnect us back to God. And that reconnection takes God with us. God's, God's never absent from his creation. It takes God with us and it moves it to God in us. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 2. Because of uh, Jesus' death and resurrection, we have entered a new era, Act 4. Act 4 is the church era. It's, it's people who have opened up to God and are letting God work in them and through them. That's what the church is. It's not a building, although buildings are a part of a the church. It's not a service, although church is a, yes, a... See, there I did it. The service is a part of church. It's not a collection of hypocrites or goody two-shoers, uh, 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 although uh, they could be part of the church. Uh, the church is a collection of people who have made the choice to open up to God, let God move in and through them, bring out the best in them so that they can bring out the best in the world around them. The church is sort of a recall back to Act 1. But instead of God hanging out with the human race, His Spirit is hanging out with us. 
and guiding us and prompting us and moving us and causing us to look inward and open up and get rid of the stuff that's holding us back and bring healing into our, in, into our heart and soul so that we can move on in the world in a way that brings his goodness and his beauty and his truth and his compassion and his generosity, generosity and creativity and honesty to the world around us. That's what the church is. It's God's spirit moving in us and doing things in our normal everyday life that we can't do on our own. And God uh, gets experienced in new ways. Let me give you a couple examples, and I'll, I'll close. One is uh, from one of you guys a few weeks ago. You were sharing this story uh, to me, and I got permission, but I'm going to keep it anonymous just, just so I don't put some undue pressure on her. But uh, she was like, I got to tell you this story. I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> uh, I was um, in, in a Target parking lot, and my son dropped his, like, little Happy Meal toy uh, down in the seats. And so I got out to go get it, and I, I, and I couldn't reach it, and so I had to, like, wiggle my hand around, and I finally got it, and then my, I realized my hand stuck. And, and I couldn't get my hand out. And so at first I was like, all right, and then after a while, um, like, my hand started to swell, my wrist started to get red, and, like, I'm like, I am stuck, stuck. And I started to panic. This is, this is her words to me. And so the only thing I could think of to do was to pray. And I said, God, please help me. Just then this pickup truck comes coming down that, the, the, uh, um, the parking lot aisle and pulls in next to me. And a guy gets out, and he looks at me and says, do you need help? <laughs> And she says, yes, I do. My <laughs> hand's stuck. I'm a little embarrassed. My hand's stuck. I was reaching for a toy for my son. And uh, so he looks around, tries to help her out, tries to jimmy if he can't. Uh, so he goes into uh, the back of his truck, opens up his toolbox, pulls out uh, some, uh, l l like, uh, you know, wire cutters or whatever, and, and snips away some of the plastic that won't hurt the car, but will give her some room and frees her hand. And uh, she's very thankful. But at that moment, um, she feels God prompting her to tell that guy he's an answer to prayer, that she prayed and he showed up. But she's also a New England Franklinite or, you know, uh, maybe Milfordite, I'm not sure. Um, and she doesn't want to do it because she doesn't want to be embarrassed, right? But the feeling is overwhelmingly strong, and so she blurts out as the guy's walking away, I prayed for you, <laughs> and you came. <laughs> and the guy looked at her and said, I know, I know, because I really strongly felt God tell me while I was trying to find a parking spot to park over there because that lady needs help. Now, you don't have to trust me. You don't have to trust her. But I, these ha things happen all the stinking time, all the stinking time. This is how God works. That's just a really, really, really small example. I've got another, another really small example real quick. I have, I have literally hundreds of these. These are just from the, the last little spell. This one happened a few days ago. We have a friend of the uh, uh, family, uh, a friend of uh, um, one of our kids, and uh, um, he gave me permission to use the story, but I'm going to um, uh, give him a fake name anyways, because, uh, you know, you don't really need to know who it is. But, uh, uh, let's call him Ted. So, good friend of the family, Ted. Ted comes from an, a, a, uh, an abusive, difficult home. And so, we hooked up Ted with one of our favorite Christian counselors. Um, and just have been trying to uh, help Ted uh, get underway and make some progress. And the counselor has been awesome for Ted. And, um, and uh, one day, uh, uh, it, was, it was either two days or three days ago, um, Ted, uh, Ted calls and says, you're never going to guess what happened. All right, tell us. <laughs> um, I had a really bad interaction with my parents, and it really caused me to spiral out of control a little bit. And, and all of a sudden, I had just suicidal thoughts really, really pouring in. Um, and I was going to reach out to um, my therapist, but uh, I know she's super booked, 
and uh, I can never get through, and uh, I've always tried to schedule extra appointments, and, and it's always like, well, I can fit you in two months from now, and I can never get her. Um, and so I, I was just feeling these thoughts, not sure what to do, when all of a sudden I got an email from my therapist, and it was an, a link in, to a appointment. Um, and then ab about like a minute later, I got a text saying, hey, sorry, I sent you a, an appointment link by accident. And so I texted him back immediately. Um, I had a really bad run-in. Do you have any time available? And the therapist texted back. Uh, this never happens, but someone just canceled. I have a half-hour appointment in, in, in like 30 minutes. Two people who are opened up to God to work in them, and what happens? Um, the therapist never texts fake appointments by, or appointments by accident. Never. It's a, that was a one-off. Um, she never has free room in her schedule. Now, you could dismiss that as coincidence, but they start to stack up over and over and over and over and over and over again. You, at, at some point, you can't say that God is not personal and works in and through people who open themselves up to him. That is the church. That is the church. And when we sort of dive into this community of people who are called out to open themselves up and let God work in them, awesome things happen in everyday life beyond what we can do on our own. So thank you for being the church. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, the story is so good. The acts of the play are so good. It's hard to believe that we're not all on board, that the whole world isn't on board. There's so many things competing for our choice, decision. And so I pray that you would um, allow us to hear, feel, see you at work in our lives. Allow us to pick up on the nudges. Allow us to have the courage and the bravery to step out on a limb and do the things that you're guiding us to do. Knowing it's you who show up, you who work, uh, and you who orchestrate the results. Thank you, in Christ's name, amen. One of the best things we could do to sort of celebrate uh, the church is to celebrate a baptism. And so I normally have baptisms up front because it's very hard to sit still, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there. And um, um, so why don't you come on up and, um, hey, Mark, can you help me with this? Oh, you're, you're my table guy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Come on up. I'll try to. Yeah. The more the merrier. Parents, godparents. Thank you. And so. Um, baptism is a, a celebration of the expansion of the church. And the church can grow two different ways. They can grow by adults sort of embracing faith. And when that happens, we have an adult baptism. There's a tank behind there that we'll pull out, fill up with water, and we'll dunk an adult. Uh, the church can also grow through birth. <laughs> um, and there's parts of the New Testament where, where it says uh, that a believer was baptized and their whole family was baptized with them, um, everyone in the household. And so that's the, uh, the, the, the birth of the church that we're celebrating, uh, the growth of the church that we're celebrating today. Not so much conversion growth, but uh, numeric multiplication through families. And so, um, but a baptism is a baptism into the family of God, the church, the promises of God. And it's a, a two-part commitment. It's a commitment on the family's life to raise up that little one in the, <clears throat> um, uh, to, to become aware of those promises, to, to learn to understand those promises, and hopefully embrace those promises 
for themselves. But it's also a commitment to us, the greater church, that when uh, we're volunteering in Kid Zone and, 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 and see these uh, little ones, uh, although just one's being baptized today, um, that we pray for them, that we model what it means to uh, live out your faith, and that we uh, just help this family along as God allows and God provides. So we have two, oh, excuse me, I have to get my Bible here. Thank you. So we have two, um, two vows we have to make. One the family has to make, and then one the church has to make. There we go. And so parents, godparents. Do you promise to do everything you can to nurture your child in the love and grace of Jesus Christ, modeling for him the Christian faith as a way of life? Okay, church, if you're on board, say, we do God helping us. Do you, church, promise to support and encourage these families in experiencing, embracing, and expressing the love of Christ? We do, God helping us. All right. That's all right. That's all right. That's awesome. Thomas Scott Trombley. I'm going to baptize you, and, and then your dad's going to read a verse. Sound good? Okay. How does that work? Is it? Shh. All right, good. Thomas, can I hold you? No, no, all right. That's cool. You can stay. You can stay. <laughs> I'm not going to push my luck. <laughs> Thomas Scott Trombley, I baptize you in the name of the Father. Oh, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do Son and Holy Spirit all in one now. <laughs> Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Mom and Dad, you can, you can tell that how you, uh, yeah, you can tell them how you sh shook off that, 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 that God water. Yeah, no, it's, all, it's all good. Uh, that actually is a great picture of the church. We are human beings. Uh, none of us are perfect perfect and we have a whole swirl of of uh, uh image of godness and uh, our human nature all swirling around dad you would you like to sure you know? there you go all right let's see if i had it all set up for i know the plans i have for you this is the lord's declaration plans for your welfare not for disaster to give you a fortune and a hope you will call to me and come, come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Perfect verse. Heavenly Father, we pray uh, for this family. Uh, we pray for all these little ones, and we pray for Thomas. And my prayer is that they would... Um, be able to experience you more and more, experience your love, your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy, understand who you are to the point where they're willing to open themselves up to lead and guide you. God, help us as a church surround them in, in uh, showing them these promises and this community of faith. And God, I pray that there's a time not too far off in the future where Thomas turns around and says, I embrace all these promises that were given to me at baptism. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand for our closing song. Please join us in singing Build Your Kingdom Here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set 
Our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church We need your power in us We seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, for you are our joy and prize. To see the captive hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. blessing from Colossians. It says, each one of you is part of the body of Christ, and you were chosen to live together in peace. So let the peace that comes from Christ control your thoughts, and be grateful. Let the message about Christ completely fill your lives, while you use all your wisdom to teach and instruct each other. With thankful hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. Have a great week, everyone.